It is my privilege that we can continue our seminar that we started. And I want to introduce the question that we asked ourselves in the last presentation, where is disease coming from? That's a question that today is most important. Uh, and if we would know where disease is coming from, we would all be at peace. Why do I sustain that the cause of disease is precisely uh, detectable? That we can know exactly the origin, where it comes from? It is because if you have an absolute foundation, it brings you to an absolute result. If anything is based on a relative foundation, then of course you have no absolute result. And in my study, everything I wanted to accomplish was to have a hundred percent surety. If a medical doctor, or to say a scientist, is not building his conclusions or his whole study on something that is absolute, then where shall that lead? How shall we ever understand what really matters? So the absolute foundations are those things that none of us can change. We only can see them. We only can acknowledge them and we can orient us after them, but we can never change them. So what would we need to know in order to understand the cause of disease? We need to know the law of nature. We need to know the human being and we need to know the needs of mankind. And as we have seen yesterday, there is a basic law of the universe that says nothing can exist or function by itself and nothing can do anything for itself. Now, this is so interesting so basic to understand. And I will make this absolute uh, statement here that says there is no problem, no negative thing that exists on our earth except this basic law is broken. Never ever there can be any issue if this basic law is not broken. Never ever. And we as humans, as we will see, we can realize things, we can acknowledge things, and we might understand where the law is broken by the way we think and do things. There was a patient, she was 29 years old, she is also a physician, and she had deep depression. And in her depression, uh, the people around her thought she might kill herself. She came to my seminar, I explained her the law of life, and she came out of her depression. What was her issue? She was married for 21 years with a gentleman who just left her for another lady. And that brought her into great distress. Now, she came out of the issue, but then after three months, she met him with his new girlfriend. And while she met, he told his girlfriend, this is my former wife. And when she heard those words, she starts weeping and cannot stop. And she calls me and says, I cannot stop weeping. Now, if we understand the law, we know that every loss of control over ourselves must be because we break this basic law. There is never ever an issue that is outside of this law. That's why it is the basic law of the universe, because nothing we do is excluded from it. If we either fulfill it and are in the law or we break it, but there is no action of man 
no thought that is not included in this law. That's why it's basic. Everything. I could find every issue of the human being in breaking this law. So I said, okay, when you lose control, you must be confused of the truth because the law is the truth. And the breaking of the law is just the result of thinking that something is different than the law. So I asked her and said, in these 11 years that you lived with your husband, how much love did you give him? And as woman's love, I saw this in my experience speaking to many females, they love with everything. They say, I gave all my love to them. Well, that's nice. How do you feel when you give all your love? And I said, I felt good. And that's how the law functions. Nothing can do anything for itself. So when we love, love doesn't search its own. Love is just giving uh, it out. And everyone that loves is right. But now the weeping comes because she is confused in her subconscious, as we will see in our presentations later, where the issue arises, she's deceived, and so she must realize the deception. So I said to her, in all those years that you gave him all love that you had, how much love did you give from yourself? And as she was quick in understanding and realizing the law in, its, in her uh, reason, she said, nothing. I said, then you can stop weeping. And so it happened. Because she thought, and this is how humans think, she thought that all the love she gave, she gave from herself. But the law says nothing can exist or function by itself. The channel can never give anything from itself. Yes, he gives it, he works with it, but all he gives does not come from him. So in the moment a person realizes the deception and the issue in which the person is, and the law is taken in as the truth in our reason, things immediately change. Everything arises because we think what we do or what we give comes from us. But there is no exception. Every one of us has an entrance and an exit, has a cause and an effect. We all function identically and there is no exception. And where there are more things together, it's evident that everything must work in a circuit, it must start in a place and comes back to the same place. So the second clear and absolute foundation is the structure of the human being because it's the same in everyone. The function that we will see later when we have finished somehow the structure even though they go one in other and we cannot absolutely separate them from each other, but we try for teaching, for education issues to realize that they are different, even though they always work together. And then of course, there is what we need, what the human needs, our basic needs are all the same in every human being. So. We started yesterday with the structure of the human being saying this, we are one organism with many organs, one organism with many organs. We are not double person, we are just one organism with many organs. And we have a center of control and we all know all wires start from the cortex. And the question that 
we had yesterday was thoughts. What are they? Where do they come from? Where do they start? What do they do? And what is their role in health? And the question that we finished our last presentation was, can the brain think? And I hope that everyone understood that chemistry can have no thinking abilities. It's impossible. But today, we, in science, that's this belief that uh, the frontal lobe is the one that uh, has morals. Now, how can a physical thing have morals? How can an iPad or a plant, let's say the, the brain is a plant, how can it have morals? How can it be able to think? We never saw this and we never can see it in nature. But why then do we suppose that a brain can think? Let's explore it. I could understand looking to nature, the animals and the humans, they have spiritual needs. They need liberty, they need safety, they need curiosity or knowledge, they need understanding, they need orientation and being holding to someone. They need loyalty. They need confirmation and reward. They need joy. They need harmony. And the humans need righteousness or justice above all things. They need truth. They need responsibility, morality, wisdom, recognition, appreciation, happiness, peace. And we could continue with the lists of the spiritual needs of humans and of animals. I never made a whole list of them. Probably they're infinite. And I call them all together love as a overtitle of a title of all spiritual needs. It's love. Look to anything of these spiritual needs and can you not compare them and say it's love? Is love not that what goes through every one of these needs? No matter which you pick up, love is that which uh, summarizes them all together. Now the question is very simple, and I think simple questions need an answer. How many of our brain cells do need one of these needs. How many scientists found out that uh, a cell cannot function if it does not get truth or righteousness or understanding? I could not find any cell that would respond or would say, I care for this. I need this. There is none. And you can search for that answer and you will find none of them. In the plant world, we have no spiritual needs. That's why we separate the animal world from the plant world. Plants have none of these needs. They are living. They live. But you have never found a plant that is curious comes along and wants to know something or that says uh, justice is something that uh, is needed or liberty walking around. Have you seen plants walking around? No, it's not possible. So in the physical world, in the plants, there is nothing of these needs. But the humans and the animals have them. Now the humans have more, have things that the animal don't have, but there's a difference uh, between the plants and the animals. And it's not just a difference on size and uh, form and color. It's a difference in function because there is more than matter in the animal and the human. I could not put 
spiritual things in a physical, um, so to say, to say the physical asks for the spiritual. I couldn't find that in nature. Maybe you can search and see if it's so. The next proof that we are more than matter is why does this lady give water to the plant? It's evident that in the plant world, there is no capacity to supply their own needs. That's why the answer is the plant cannot walk to the water. If the plant could walk to the water, then she would never water the plant. Because she would say, well, if she needs water, she just should go and take it, like an animal would do. So this is why we have to understand very well nature. In nature, there is no exception in the plant world, they cannot go to supply the needs. That's why if we compare our body with a plant, then we understand why we have hunger, thirst, fatigue, cold, sweating. These are body reactions, as we have seen yesterday, that show that the body lacks something. But why does he show it? To whom does he show it? Why would he not go when he's hungry to eat? When he's thirst to drink, when he's tired to lay down. Well, the symptom itself, that what we feel, proves that the body cannot do it. Because he has a commander that is above him that must supply his needs. If the body could sleep when he needs it, I could not control anything because the body would control me. And when I have something important to do, even though I'm tired, he would lay me up to sleep. If I don't want to eat because I'm fasting, he would force me to eat. But that's not possible. Because in the physical world, there is no way that the need shall be supplied. You must bring it close. So in order, the plant then, or the physical item, can take it in and give it and pass it on. So only a spirit can feed a body with food, water, oxygen, and so on. So only because we have a spiritual entity in us and the animals, it is possible that we can move and also supply our needs. The body can hunger as much as he wants. If I don't put something into the stomach so that from there he can take it, nothing happens. There is no way that in the plant world, in the physical living world, there should be the capacity to satisfy or to supply with the needs. And there comes the third point that we must be more than matter. And that is one that is very interesting. That is when there is a conflict between the physical and the spiritual needs. I think none of us denies that he has physical and spiritual needs. And they must come in conflict. That is, I need food or water or sleep, but I also need to do something I have to fulfill a certain task that we call purpose. So the body has life and spiritual needs fulfill purpose. Now, if they are in a conflict, what will you do? What can you renounce to and what not? Just yesterday I read a news that in Japan they're dying per month more people from suicide than from the existing lung disease. More people dying in one month from suicide than 
in a year from all the disease that we have now going on and looks like there is only one any uh, uh, i mean only one symptom how does that come what happens how can it be that a rational being would take his own life the answer is very simple because life without purpose is nothing and since the information that is around globally in this world takes away the purpose it makes you a criminal just by your existence then you must either kill yourself or kill the others so that you can fulfill your purpose every problem that we have or the disease is never a survival issue it's always an issue of purpose there was another lady who told me the story of her nephew that had a girlfriend he had a girlfriend she he was 24 if i remember well and his girlfriend was 22 years old and at a certain point the girlfriend finished with him the relationship and he couldn't bear it because she was his purpose so he took the gun of his father invited the girl for a ride in the car and shoot her and him to death why do rational beings do that why is the the mental issue greater than the life issue i could see this in all my consultations with the patients the issue of disease is never a physical issue because we can renounce life you see these people who today run into death they want to escape they want to escape to not live with a purpose they don't see any purpose in life anymore so while we can renounce on life we can never give up purpose never ever if we lose the purpose we're gone this is why it's so important to understand where is the purpose can i lose the purpose when the girlfriend leaves me can i lose the purpose when there is a information around that i'm a criminal just by my existence is that is that purpose does the my purpose depend on what others say or do does my purpose depend on circumstances or does it just depend on what i do so reality proves that humans are more than matters matter and that the more than matter is more important than matter that is life as we were taught would be the center of everything is just a lie maslow and all his pyramid is just a deception because we have not seen nature and we have not seen ourselves in the mirror we will never have a fight in the family in relationships if it's not about purpose if it's not about love everything that gives purpose is spiritual there is nothing in the physical world that gives you purpose so the proof that we must be more than matter is that we can renounce that what science would tell us is so important health is not the most important thing because life is not the most important thing that's why the issue to put something as more important than something else brings a whole 
thing into a terrible situation to put the wagon before the horses makes everything to break. Because the only way it functions is the horses must be before the wagon. The spiritual needs, if we want to know it or not, are always before the physical ones. The wagon is pulled by horses, not the other way around. The wagon cannot pull the horses. It's impossible. That's why in life, purpose is that what matters. So, in order, when we, when we understand that, then we must know why do we have so many depressed people? Why do we have so many issues? Because humans don't know where their purpose is. How can it be reached? So we will go deeper into that later in other lectures. Now, a fourth proof that we must be more than matter is that we have this hierarchy. There is a leading force in man. And the question is, is it the brain, the body? Because we have seen in the brain, the whole body is together. It's all in the cortex. So does the cortex rule the human being or the spirit? Who is the one that directs things? Now, if we have two entities, the cortex and the spirit, then we must understand how they work together, how they communicate together. And we have seen that hunger and thirst is a communication of the body that comes through the limbic system and the cortex to the spirit who needs to realize, okay, my body needs something and I must understand what he needs. And his needs are always physical needs. Can now the feeling of hunger or even of pain force the spirit to act? And is the feeling for hunger that what makes the spirit to do something or can he say no? Well, we all know it, that the spirit is an entity that does not need to obey what is said to him. We know that from child education and we know that even in our relationship with our pets, they don't do what we demand from them. And that's the proof that there must be a spirit who you can ring on, you can knock on the door, you can ask, but if he does not want to, nothing happens. That's very important to understand. In the physical world, you have only reactions, never actions. The spirit and the spiritual world, you have action and reaction. So the spirit can react to that what the body asks from him. But the body can never force the spirit to obey. That's very important to understand it. It makes the basic difference from the physical world to the spiritual world. In the spiritual world, there is no force. And people come and say, well, he abused me spiritually. Now, how can you do that? Now, others can shout to us and we might get afraid. I'm also a very, uh, so to say, sensitive person. I need harmony and when someone is not speaking nice or behaving nice to me, I'm, I get scared because it's not a need of the spirit to be in an environment where there is disharmony. But however, if someone behaves wrongly or he speaks words to me that are not right or not according to the needs of the spirit, is, then he, is he then abusing me spiritually? It's not possible. It's only my action 
to that what another person does or says that will harm me. It's not his action. His action can harm my body. But the, but the spirit cannot be harmed. That's so important to understand the two entities. The one can be harmed. I can be put into prison. I can, I can be smashed, so to say, uh, in my body. Someone can cut away my hand. But he can never force my spirit to do that what he wants me to do. He will never be able to do that. I only will do what the other says if the other one convinces me or he has my needs. And then I might obey without wanting to obey because I am in a great dependency. So if the spirit is free, that is, he cannot be forced to obey, then he must act always. That's why in this situation that we have in the world like now, it's a spiritual battle that brings the spirit into confusion. But the only way to bring the spirit into confusion is to, so to say, give him an information that he believes that his need is taken away by the other one. Let's say liberty, freedom of speech, whatever we see today is in a, a great, great uh, danger. So whenever we think that someone else has my needs, we must obey because the spirit is dependent. That's why he does things in order to keep his, his well-being. That's why he might eat uh, or he might sleep because he has a need to feel well. And now someone comes and says, I do you and a bad feeling if you don't obey me. And then if he believes that the other can take away his spiritual needs from him, then he must do the, the, the work of the other one that uh, forces him, or not, not forces him, he, he must obey. That's how children function. Uh, they have their own spirit and their own will, and I have them in my practice, and they don't want to obey, to open their mouth. And now, in order to help them, if they don't want to open the mouth, the mother needs to buy their spirit and tell them that they receive something that they like. No matter what that is, it's a preferred thing. And then the child says, oh, if I get that, so then I open my mouth. Because it makes a, a calculation, it reasons what is for it better. So if mother has the need of the child, then the child will do things, even though it doesn't want them, but it must do it because it wants that what the mother offers. So this is how people can be manipulated if they don't know. But it's still not the other one who manipulates them. It's because they themselves are in an error and react to that the wrong way. So there is no spiritual abuse. I can be in prison and I can be perfectly free. No matter. Because the spirit can no one take prison. Only myself. And as we go on, we will go deeper into the study of the way a spirit functions than uh, the body. And now it's, it's nice to see the function of the body because that's evident, but it's even more uh, beautiful to see the capacities of a mind. So when the spirit thinketh, the thoughts are commands to the body. 
Because we know in the physical world, there is no action. It's only reaction. That's why my body responds to the impulse of the spirit to my brain. So he gives the command and I speak. Of course, I speak with the body, but it's not the body who speaks. It's just the spirit who speaks through the body because the body can never speak. So there's an hierarchy. As we have seen, the spiritual needs are higher than the physical ones. If the spirit or the psyche would be that what comes out of the brain as a result of the brain, then this could not happen. If the brain would direct the human being, then purpose would be not the first, but life would be first. If the brain would conduct and make the spirit, then we could command the spirit and he would follow the commands. But that's not possible. So that's a fourth or fifth proof that we must be more than matter. The body reactions always to order commands or external factors because there is no action from inside. Only the spirit can act from inside. The last proof, I think this is the legal evidence. That's why it's so powerful. The legal evidence, the need of energy. The brain needs power. And the question is, what is the difference between a living person and a dead one? What is missing in the brain? Now we all can measure that. The physical things are measurable. We all have electrical current and we can measure them how they are in the left and in the right hemisphere. So the question is, who makes the electrical impulse that we can measure to the brain? And there is no other answer than the spirit. The spirit through thoughts, decisions, makes the electricity. He is as a wind that moves the trees. So the spirit moves our body. So it's by the electrical input that the spirit makes through his decisions that we are living. If the spirit is separated from the body, the supplier of life is gone and then the human is dead. That's the result. We only die, an animal only dies, because its body and its mind, its spirit, are separated. Otherwise, we could not die. It's not possible. So, let's see the summary of the evidences that we must have a spirit. Without a spirit, there is no spiritual mind activity. We would not be conscious. Now, consciousness does not only depend on the spirit, but consciousness is just possible through the spirit. There are no spiritual needs, yes, because the body doesn't ask for them. There are no sensory perception, feeling, sight, smell, taste, hearing. They are just possible because there exists a spirit. Now, yes, without the eyes that we have in the body, the spirit cannot see anything. But the eyes don't see, the body does not feel, the uh, ear does not hear, it just transmits a wave to the spirit who then depicts and says, oh, this is the word that says this and this and this. So it's a, always a work of combination of body and spirit. But without the spirit, the body would never see anything. Like we have cameras on our devices, but a camera never saw a thing, can never see a thing, can never smell. Put the camera somewhere and see if it smells. So it's not possible. There are no thoughts or thinking. There's no way of that the brain or the body can think. Now the brain is used for thinking. Like the feet are used for walking. But neither the feet can walk nor the brain can think. It's only the spirit that has the capacity to think. And he uses the brain in order to think. He uses the brain in order to uh, put the input there so that the 
body responds to his thoughts. That's important to understand. And there would be no judgment. There would be never responsibility in a physical thing. Would you ever give responsibility to a robot? I mean, it's nonsense, at least to my reason, to give responsibility to a device. It never had, it will never have. There is no morality, no ethics in a brain. How should a brain know about ethics? It's just absurd to think that our thoughts are coming because between the synapses, there are electrical impulses and those electrical impulses are the thought. I mean, we can have fantasy and we have enough. We see that today, how uh, fantasy works. But there is no way even to have a fantasy without the spirit because it is not physical. There is no spirituality. People would not be spiritual if they would have no spirit. There would be no religion. There would be no teaching. What would you teach a physical thing? Have you ever taught a robot to do something? You program him. You don't teach him. If there would be no spirit, there would be no teaching. Because only a spirit can learn things. We would have no ideologies. We would not fight over um, left or right or... Yes, we, we, how would we do that? Having no ability to, for the spiritual approach. There would be never, ever something like worship that people do without having a spirit. And the most evident proof that we must have a spirit is that we can move ourselves. So we, we can move. In the plant world, there is no moving possible. The plants are moved by the wind. That's why the spirit is also called the wind, because he moves everything. If we wouldn't have the winds on our earth, we would never have a plant moving. Never ever. So that's why we must look into our mirror and see ourselves that we are more than matter. And that what we are more than matter must have also an origin. Where does the spirit come from? Does it come from the brain? And we have seen it is excluded that the body makes the mind, the, they are in a combination, but the spirit can never have its origin in the body. So where then does it come from? So there are a few theories about the human nature, anthropologies, and we will go shortly to them just because of time issue. We just mention them so that we know that the humans have occupied their mind to understand what are they composed of. And there is the idea that we have three different entities, body, that is chemistry, spirit, and soul. And it is believed that the soul includes the spirit because we, they believe that the soul is, as the spirit, a spiritual thing. Now, those are beliefs, those are hypotheses that are coming from the old times, the Platonic and Aristotelian view of this, and this view most people have taken over, saying that we have two, uh, we have three separate entities. Because Plato believed that the human is a god that caught himself somehow in an animal body. And when he dies, then the body goes away and the soul becomes free and he goes back into his divinity. That's why they were saying that uh, to be in the body or to have a body is evil. So they waited and some also go into suicide thinking, okay, we uh, must become free. And when you die, you don't die because your soul just becomes free and goes into eternity 
where he comes from eternity. This is the basics of most religions. Uh, it's the basic thinking. Uh, it's old and it's taken over with different nuances. But basically, most people think things are like this. And then there is the other theories that say that was the Stoic and Epicurean view that says everything is chemistry. The human being is only from matter and the spiritual abilities appear like love when there is a burning in the cells. The result of that is love. So this is the view of science today. That's why science has uh, become a dictatorship, so to say, because they want to bring the human being down to just matter. Just life matters. Just health matters. Really? Is, are the spiritual things of our being and of the animals because of a chemical burning? So let's take our drug and then we will feel well. Because love is a chemical transmission. Really? Do you really think that love is endorphins? Do you think that the body can do anything or act to anything? That's against all against the law. The law does not permit. The basic law of everything does not allow that a physical thing should act. It only reacts. Let's be very clear on that. Every physical thing gives only reactions. I push a button and it reacts. But it has no action of its own. But we have action of our own. There's only one real thing and that is when we look to the law. And this is the lawful understanding of humanity. The body is chemistry, body and spirit, which is not chemical because love is not chemical. It's not endorphins. Our decisions are not made by endorphins. The endorphins are the result of our decisions. Yes, but not the other way. It's the horses before the car, not the car before the horses or the wagon before the horses. So body and spirit together give the soul. That's the lawful view and that's also the biblical view for those who have a Bible and can read. So there is no way. The truth is we have a combination of physical with spiritual and that gives a new entity which is the soul. And I compare this in a simple illustration. We have the piano which is the body so to say in the picture and we have the player which is the spirit. And what is the result of the connection of the interaction of spirit with the body? Now that combination when the spirit acts the body the piano cannot act from itself. I hope everyone knows that. And he might bring out beautiful sounds, but only as a reaction of an input of a player. So the input of the player into the body makes the music. And the music is a result of these two entities, the body and the spirit, the piano and the player. So music is a new thing. We would have it. The piano would have no wail without the player. And the player without the piano would make no sounds. So the soul is the result of two entities playing together in which the spirit has its control. Because the piano, yes, the piano brings out the sound. You don't hear the player. You just hear the sound of the piano and you know the player is playing it. This is the most simple illustration that I can find 
that the soul is not a separate entity, is just the result of two entities working together. Like water is the result of oxygen and hydrogen. But we don't say water is oxygen and hydrogen. It's the water. We drink it. But the water is not an entity of itself. It is just a result of a combination of two things or even more. So, looking to the biblical explanation of the human nature, we find that the origin of man comes from earth. God took a piece of earth and formed him and breathed in the breath of life and out of the earth became a body and out of the breath of life it transforms into a spirit and both together give the soul that is and must be connected to God. So, looking to the scheme of our brain, so we have here the cortex and our body, we could call it the piano, and you must have the spirit above the cortex, that is, the piano player must push the keys, and the spirit pushes the keys through thoughts, and by thoughts makes the electricity, because the body can only be put into action not by thought, so to say, it must become physical, so that the body reacts, and electricity is physical, the electricity gives the impulse, the body reacts to that impulse, and so the human being becomes a soul. Because everything we do happens just in this space between the spirit and the body. That's the soul. Everything we do, everything we experience, happens just in our head. That's why it's so important in the crises that we are today and all other crises that we have in our lives to understand that the battle, that the issue is just in our head. And if we have there a clear spirit, things might be very well. And especially if the spirit is known and trusts his maker. So I want to introduce the first case that I had in my practice where I have seen the interaction of the body and the spirit, how disease appears. This is a very simple case in which we can see the pattern. And when you once saw the pattern, you will see the pattern will always repeat itself because we all function the same. So we repeat once again, we have a body that starts in the cortex, that has all the keys in the cortex, and the rest is just listening or responding to the cortex, the body just reacts to the input of the spirit. And those both together making the living soul. Now, this lady has severe headaches since two weeks and no medication helps for her to relieve her headaches. And so after two weeks, the uh, primary doctor sends her to me as an ENT, ENT to see if maybe she has a sinusitis or something in in her nose and the sinuses, I do my consultation, I don't find anything. She is uh, at the age of 30, in her beginning of the 30s, and she makes to me a very painful uh, face. You see, you can see face, if you can read faces, you can see the pain in the faces. And she was really uh, not even hiding it, that she has pain. So. I sent her urgently to the CT scan, she came back the same day and we found a perfect CT scan. No sinusitis, no tumors, no bleeding, nothing that would explain the headaches. Now, we must understand headaches and everything that we feel must be physical. Yes, it's from the body that we feel pain when we hurt our finger with uh, a device like a hammer, not pointing it correctly, we get pain. And that pain comes from the body, it comes from the limbic system that brings up a chemical reaction to the cortex which is felt by the spirit as pain. So everything a person feels is from its body. We must just know that the body only reacts. And this uh, last year, where since we have this crisis going on in the world, 
I had many patients that coming to me with uh, a knot in the throat, and they say, I'm, I'm, there is something I cannot swallow correctly. I can eat very well, but it's, it's there. And sometimes when I lay down, I, I have the impression I don't get any air anymore. What's that? That is a body reaction to fear. And since fear is reigning the world today, uh, people must get, if they believe what is said, they must get a physical reaction. But that physical reaction doesn't come because some uh, external factors have invaded the body in order to uh, have their some, some issues. But yes, people want sometimes to take a specimen to see if there are, are fungus or bacteria. And I do that and I just to prove them that that's not the case. We have a muscular tension that makes us aware that the body reacts to something that is not body-like. It is not according to the needs of the body. That's why we have pain. If the hammer would be well for the body, then uh, we would feel good when we hit it. And the more we hit it, the better we would feel. But that's not the case. The body shows that there is a thing that is destroyed by the hammer and the spirit who handles the hammer should pay more attention to it. So the body reacts to something. Now, I must know that she can have the headaches because she was beaten or she fell down from somewhere, she injured her head, but she had none of them. She might have been poisoned, but she was not poisoned. Uh, the headaches could not be explained with a physical action, I mean with a physical interaction, so that the body should react. And so I had to see what she was thinking. And then I asked her, what happened two weeks ago? And she said, two weeks ago, I came to realize that my boyfriend has betrayed me. She was with this boyfriend for one year together. She left her home in the north and came down to the south. And she was willing to give up everything in order to be with the guy that now, after one year, she finds out that he betrays her. So we understand her issue. But why does she have headaches? Is the headache a proof that she thinks correctly or that she thinks incorrectly? And I was curious to see how she was thinking before and after the information. So before she had loving thoughts, free thoughts. And if we have loving and free thoughts, our decisions that are at the output of our spirit put our body into motion. The electrical current brings us a very good feeling. The limbic system responds and says, well, give me more of that because that fits to me. So loving thoughts, free thoughts can never do any damage to our brain and to the rest of the body. They're just made to be so. A free spirit does not do his body harm. But now she hears the information about a friend. And that information comes to her spirit, knocks at the door. And evidently, it is against her need that she has. And now she needs to respond to that. And since it's against her need, she responds. But her response is not according to the body because she is disappointed, hurt, has revengeful thoughts, and those electrical impulses bring the pain. So the body shouts and says, please don't give me that anymore. Now the question was, does she do that because she wants to? Do we make our pain because we want to? I think it's the same thing, like you want to point the, the nail, but Unfortunately, you, you didn't hit the nail, but you hit your finger. It's by accident. It's not that you want to, but the pain just 
helps you to take a device or do something to not hit yourself again. And so the same happens when the spirit reacts to situations that are against his needs with pressure, with his appointment, then he brings pain and dysfunction into his body. But he doesn't do that because he wants to. He must do it because he calculates the information the wrong way. And this is the pattern of every person's thinking. This is the pattern of how disease happens. You hear an information that doesn't fit your need, your spiritual need, and then you react through the error that brings you into this situation that then makes your body sick. And at the beginning, it might be just headaches, but in five or ten years, she has from the same way of calculating that information, she has cancer or diabetes or whatever. So, every human being becomes his own enemy when others don't do the right. That's also the example of why suicide is so, so, so growing, even though you don't hear anything about it in the news. Uh, so, it's growing because the information that comes from outside is proceeded against myself. You see, when, when we go against that what is right, we don't destroy the outside, we destroy ourselves. That's why it's so uh, significant or so, so wise when Jesus says, do not resist him who does you unrighteousness. Well, if, and, but righteousness is our need. How can you not resist to him that does to you unrighteousness? Because what he does is unright. Yes. But why do then I have headaches and not him? Why is the victim always the one that destroys himself? And seeing this, in all my patients, there is not one exception. It is by the error we are born with that we become our own enemies when things outside of us are not going to our needs. So this is on one side a terrible thing. On the other side, if disease comes because of an inside error of the spirit, there might be help in changing the way the spirit thinks. So I was interested to find out the error. And the error is because we don't know the law and how relationships function. So this is me or you, and it's the spouse, the father if you have, a mother, children, pets, whatever relationship you can put in here. And the question is, do I have a relationship with these individuals because I love them in order to give them something? Or do I want to receive something, to get something from them? Or why do I have the relationship with them? Now, why did this lady move from the north to the south? Because she had so much love to get rid of that love? Or because she wanted to receive something? Now, some people come and say, well, it's both. Now, no, the law doesn't know both. A circuit goes only in one direction. Yes, it might be this or that, but it's still one direction. There's no exchange in this way as we perceive it. That's why I could see that all the issues of humanity that leads him to disease is because he thinks he's dependent for love from the acts and existence of others. If my spirit is dependent 
on what my wife does, or if she exists or not, or if the parents exist, then, of course, I'm lost. If my purpose lies in the acts and the existing of others, then destruction must be there. If I believe that the enemy is outside of me, then I have no way ever to solve an issue. Through the deception that we have in us, through the error, we all go into relationship with just one goal, and that is to receive. Oh, you might think, oh, by, but I'm caring for others all the time, and I have patience that says, I'm have. I lost to think on myself anymore. I'm just caring, caring, caring for others. Well, then you must be the most healthy person. If it's not about receiving. Because giving is fulfilling the law. It's the second part. You give because you can do nothing for yourself. And by giving, you fulfill your purpose. It's by your action. But no, the deception leads us to the error that it is the others. And so when we enter into a relationship, it doesn't matter with which person, the other becomes our debtors because we are the one that gives first and now expects something back. Now that is the breaking of the law. Because the law says, whatever you give, you must take first. And if you are aware that everything that you give, you just took before, then the other one is never your debtor. He doesn't owe you at no time anything. But what does this lady think about this person here in the picture? Why is she behaving, shouting to him? Why is she expecting something from him? Because the error leads you to the idea that the other does not fulfill my need. I need justice, love, kindness from others. Do we need justice from the government? Do we need justice from a from a judge? I hope not. Because then they become our dependency. Can another person fulfill our needs? Never. Can another hurt our feelings? Never. But we all believe it, it's so. Does a husband or a boyfriend owe his girlfriend faithfulness or loyalty? Never. But we all believe it's so. And all our issues come because we take others into judgment. The lady in, the, in my case uh, wanted to keep her boyfriend, but she wanted to keep him only if he's loyal. And now she, her mind was spinning around thinking, how can I make him to be loyal to me? Now, who is she that he might be loyal to her? Is she above her? Is she her, her uh, so to say, the one that needs to listen to her? Is she not an individual that can think and act like he wants to act? Why do we go to others and are afraid of others and want to change others? Why is the human being behaving like that? The crisis we are in shows that fear from another person brings you into despair. Fear from something that you cannot control brings you to despair. But it's not the information itself. It is just how you and I process that information. That's why we must look a little bit closer into our mirror to understand ourselves, to understand our nature, to understand how we are built in order to be able to control our lives, knowing how we reach purpose and knowing how we do not reach purpose. Understanding ourselves, understanding what's wrong in us will help us to do some changes if we want to become healthy. So even if on one side, it's a terrible thing that we are our own enemies. But on the other side, it gives us the 
chance to solve the issue. Because if the cause of disease is outside of me, I can never change it. I can never, I can never have control over my life. If the cause is outside. So yes, it's evil. It's bad that we have an error in us that leads us to self-destruction. But if we understand it and are able to remove the error, our life becomes free and healthy. And this is the purpose of the seminar. And in our next lectures, we're going deeper into the subconscious, wanting to understand why we do like we do. I think that's most important. Understanding your thoughts, understanding your actions, understanding why do I do this is most revealing and most helpful because none of us can uh, govern us than ourselves.